Hello, everybody. Good morning. I'll be happy if everybody will be seated. I'd like to introduce the panelists. Ayman Seth sitting next to me. Between 2008 and 18, he's the head of the Authority for Development in the Arab Society. Nasrin Khadad Khaj Yihye, she's the director of the program for Israeli Arab relationship. Professor Muhammad Wate, the, the dean of the law department in Safed, and Khader uh, Sawayed, he is an investigator in INSS. In the next hour, we would like to discuss the dualism in the government approach towards the Arab minority in Israel on the one hand, where the government uh, does allocate uh, quite a lot of budget to promote uh, the growth of the Arab population, the five-year plan that we will discuss in uh, 2020. On the other hand, the government and the politicians who are alienating the Arab population uh, w for example, the nation law. And we will try to see how these two tracks can actually promote uh, the integration of the Arab minority in Israel, or perhaps, in fact, they lead us to another way. And I would like to start uh, with your permission with a personal question to each of you. What is the significance to be a citizen in the state of Israel from a personal and professional point of view from the position that you're in today. Nasreen, you're the only woman in the panel, so I'd like to start with you. Thank you, Karen. First of all, I'd like to thank INSS for inviting me. This is a place where I feel good to uh, appear, and I want to see this, say this self-evident that I love this place. I really think that uh, God gave us uh, the best little acre uh, on earth. And I am working in my field because I believe that you can turn Israel to a much better place. And now to your question. How is it uh, to be an Arab uh, citizen or a Palestinian citizen in a Jewish state? As, uh, yes, but as we say, we're going to get to the but. So, as you know, possibly it's very complex, uh, very complicated to be an Arab citizen in the state of Israel. I feel that there's a dual kind of discourse with this government. On the one hand, the government tries to integrate us in the Israeli economy. On the other hand, this government now made sure to instigate against us in very many opportunities. It started with the last elections that the PM said, that uh, the Arabs are uh, moving in droves uh, to the ballots. They didn't want us to realize our right uh, to vote. That was on the one hand. But on the other hand, it uh, continued with the very problematic statements of various uh, ministers. Two years ago, uh, somebody said where they demolished 11 uh, uh, homes in Kalanswa that our forces are uh, acting. It's very militant kind of discourse uh, relating to us as enemies. This is something that ignites uh, a red light among all of us, and we must do everything possible to change this. So the discourse is very problematic. As uh, for 922, wait, 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 that's, uh, this is the personal question. I just, I just want uh, there's a very close friend of mine, Dina, sitting in the audience, and she said that personal stories are the best. So I want to tell you a personal story that tells you what it means to be a Palestinian Arab citizen in the state of Israel. I have three daughters, Carmel, 14, Hala, 10, and Niv is three. Eight years ago, I sat to... I had a conversation with my tutor, who was on sabbatical in the States, and I asked my daughter, who was six years old at the time, to be quiet. And half an hour later, my daughter comes up to me, and she says to me, I know why you wanted me to be quiet. And I said, uh, I said yes, why? Why did I want you to be quiet? I wanted to concentrate on my thesis. 
And she said to me, no, that's not true, you're lying. You didn't want your tutor to know that you're an Arab. If the tutor will know you're an Arab, they're going to uh, banish you from the Tel Aviv University. And I think this is what it's all about. A six-year-old girl lives in a house that Jews come in and out all the time, where at the age of six, that she feels she sees a second-class citizen in the state of Israel. And I think anybody who's sitting here in this hall or on stage, this is something we have to uh, conquer because Arab kids should uh, grow up uh, feeling that the sky is the limit and not to feel that they're a second-class uh, citizen. We have to change the orientation of our Arab children. So we're going to go back to you when we talk about the five-year plan, but from a personal point of view, what about you? Do you feel good morning? First of all, it's great to be part of this state, and we're talking about a very advanced country. Uh, we have an innovative technological state, but as an Arab, uh, citizen is a challenging thing, let's say. Of course, there are many positive things that are happening uh, regarding the Arab society, but there's a lot of gra gaps um, uh, among some of the population. And you said personal stories. I'll tell you how it illustrates what it means. So I personally, you know, I got to the highest position in the government. I'm the director of the Authority for Economic Development in the Prime Minister's office, and I had the opportunity to establish a very strong unit. And personally, a week ago, let me tell you, I don't know if it illustrates our situation, but it's relevant. I went with my wife and my two kids to adopt a, a dog for my child. Uh, she wanted the dog, and I said, instead of buying, there are many uh, stray dogs. So we went over there, and she started asking me, where are you from? And I said, from Vadiara, from the Arab village. And she said, there's a decision or a directive that we do not approve to Arab population, to Arabs, to adopt dogs in this center. What is it? It's a... Yeah, it's like uh, an NGO, uh, an NGO to adopt dogs. They had a situation, apparently, that they gave a dog to one of the families, a young Arab, and the dog ran away. Anyway, there was a whole story, one or two, in that area, and they made a decision. They're not going to give dogs to Arabs at all. To And look, a kid, she's eight years old, and uh, and uh, she knows Hebrew very well. She hears it. What kind of message does it convey to this eight-year-old girl? She lives in the state of Israel, and she's part of the Israeli society. So on the one hand, I'm saying, okay, I reached a very high position, and I'm very, very happy about it, and a lot of opportunities. But on the other hand, you have these cases of uh, discrimination and racism that still exists. Professor Watted. We have uh, your six-year-old, is eight years old. What is your personal story? I don't want to start with the personal story, although I can tell you that three days ago, I have a new daughter, three days ago, Mazel Tov. Congratulations. Uh, we're talking about my dual citizenship, it be as a citizen of the state of Israel and as a son of the Arab nation, is an unnatural birth in circumstances, in circumstances that it was shaped. But you cannot deny the fact that I'm an Israeli citizen uh, for all intents and purposes. I speak Hebrew. Uh, and I pronounce uh, the Chet uh, unlike the Arabs because I am a lecturer and when I appear to people I need an Israeli accent. Uh, but you cannot ignore the fact that I'm an Arab. When something happens to any Arab anywhere in the world, I feel something. What is this? Something I cannot explain exactly. But unfortunately, there's a conflict, a uh, continuous conflict between my uh, civil identity and my national identity. Who's right, who less right, that's not interested. But my role as a citizen of the State of Israel, who lives in the State of Israel, 
and uh, is a son of the Arab nation to find uh, the balance needed so that these two identities will be able to live side by side. I have the tools to do it because I'm a legalist. I also have the tools to do it because I belong to the minority. When you're a minority, you see things that the majority cannot see. The, uh, the Jewish minority in Europe saw things that uh, they saw 30, 40, 40, 50 years later. I can give you a lot of examples. Uh, you know, I'm a professor for law uh, regarding civil uh, rights, etc., etc. But therefore, I don't see any reason by the fact that I'm an Arab or Israeli any conflict. But I have to focus on one important thing. Citizenship uh, demands loyalty, not the way Lieberman uh, 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 identifies it. I'm supposed to be a patriot. Patriot is something you feel, it's emotional. When you see a football team of Israel playing in the Mondial, even if they lose 10 to 1, you feel that you want them to win. Why? You don't even know them, you never met them. But when I see a game of the State of Israel, I want them to win, I want to be in the Mondial. This is my country. But loyalty and patriotism are not supposed to be complete blindness. If I want to be loyal to the nation and to my citizenship, my duty is also to know how to criticize my nation and my country, and not just to praise it, because criticism has limits, and the limits are the moment somebody wants to raise a hand. You cannot raise a hand against your country. You can criticize it. You can play the political game, the legal game, the political game, but you do not raise a hand, rather, neither on your nation nor on your state. Let's talk about legislation. One is from your own perspective. Hi, hello all. From my own perspective, well, and from the perspective of everyone in the world, I mean, being Israeli is something complex, let alone when you talk about being an Arab citizen, a minority in Israel. An Israeli citizen is complex, or twice as complicated, maybe seven times as complicated. The fact that the nation to which I belong, and so do my, as do my friends, is in perpetual conflict for more than 70 years since the first wave of immigration, 1882, is in perpetual conflict with the state I belong with to. And since I was born, and since my father was born in 1948, that places me in an uncomfortable position. However, I personally, and if we look at the Arab population since 1948 and to date, 99.999% are loyal citizens in the sense of being loyal to the law, adhering by law, paying taxes, and not um, harming the, f so the security of the state. Of course, there are people who break the law everywhere, but it doesn't in any way speak to the general uh, character of the population. And my Israeliness, uh, in my own pers personal perspective, I think the best uh, manifestation I can give is that when I still am a fan of Maccabi Haifa, and I'm sorry from, uh, that everyone here in Tel Aviv probably disagrees with me, but all those times when we defeated the yellow Maccabees and the empire shall return, but speaking about we beat Manchester United 3-0 was for me just sheer delight. And when we hugged Jews, Arabs, nobody cared whether you were an Arab or not. Nobody looked at your ID card or your passport before they hugged you. When Yanni Katan just tore their net apart, we just hugged each other because we were all Maccabi Haifa fans. And Haifa, the city where I studied, where I spent many of my years, is a symbol of coexistence, and I don't even like the word coexistence so much, but rather the joint, the shared existence. It is possible and we do it every single day, and I feel it when I work at the INSS, as I have done for the last two years, it is a sheer delight. It's challenging, certainly, but it's possible. Okay, so Maccabi Haifa, I'm sorry, my condolences, but okay. 
So I'd like to begin with you, Ayman Sef. Let's talk about the five-year plan, Plan 922 from 2015 to 2020. And when I review economics, every time I see these five-year plan for the Arab sector, the North plan, I ask myself two questions. First of all, I'm not impressed by the large amounts. Yes, it's between 15 and 20 million she billion shekels, but how much of it is really new money and not money that was earmarked in the budget in any case? That's one question I'd like you to answer. And the second is, if you give a budget framework, it doesn't mean it's actually put to practice because we know there is so much red tape from beginning to end that at the end of the day, in many cases, only some of this budgetary framework is actually put to practice. So let's get an insight on both of these points. How successful was the five-year plan? Where did it bring new money and so on? Okay, I will try to sort of summarize this within a few minutes to say what the government has done in the last few uh, years to integrate the population. Until about 10 years ago, nothing was done. And I think over the last decade, there really has been a tremendous and significant change in government policy since 2007 or 2008. I think the penny dropped for the government that if they don't integrate the Arab population, by the way, also the ultra-Orthodox population, Israel will not be able to be one of the most developed countries in terms of GDP and so on. So it doesn't matter if you like the Arabs or you don't like the Arabs, if you like the ultra-Orthodox or you don't, you need to invest in these two populations and integrate them. The penny dropped around 2008, and then we began with a whole series of government resolutions. I began my capacity in my job in 2008, and then we started to really lead government resolutions. Between t 2010 and 2015, it was a billion shekel here, a billion shekel there, in employment, in transportation, in housing, in planning. We didn't do anything very significant because the money was uh, small and the Arab population's needs, and you need to remember that we need to close gaps of about 60 years until about 10 years ago. So in 2015, there really was a huge opportunity where the budget unit, there was a guy called Amir Levy, who was the head of budget in the Ministry of Finance. We got together the two of us, and we said, let's make a big change in government policy. And we put together a report, which was the basis for 922, which showed the huge gaps between the Arab and Jewish populations in Israel. And something that's very important for you to understand, we examined the um, the different budgets and different ministries, and it's inconceivable we discovered only 5%. I'll give you a few examples. Only 5% in informal education goes to the Arab sector, but we're 20% of the population. Only 7% of the Ministry of Transportation budgets go to the Arab population, even though we're 20% of the population. And that is really the core of the problem. The ministries of the government in Israel don't budget the Arab sector properly. Plan 922, which was approved at the end of 2015, it was very difficult to convince the government it's a right-wing government. We sat in three government meetings in order to um, actually approve this amount, which is 15 to 20 billion. I heard terrible things about the Arab sector in these meetings. It was very difficult to sit there as an Arab Israeli citizen, but the resolution was um, made, and we have allocated about 6 billion shekels to the local authorities to implement this decision. The plan is being implemented, unlike previous plans, which, as you said, were not actually implemented, and there are two challenges. The first is that the government ministries also need to take responsibility of the implementation of these budgets, but we too, the Arab society and the local Arab authorities, also have huge responsibility to actually implement this money, these shekels that are currently in their in the local authorities um, budget most of it is being implemented but any shekel that is not being put to practice I uh, I find difficult to handle because we took st such pains to make this resolution pass and some of the local authorities in the Arab sector 20 percent maybe 25 percent in some of these clauses, some of this money will go back, and we shouldn't uh, have that happen. We must say that these investments of the government have led to tremendous changes in Arab society. The employment among Arab women, I'm sure you've heard of it, is beyond 40%, like we like in television. Give me the two key points where you think there has been great progress and the two points that you'd like to see progress in, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay, so in women's employment, we have grown from 20% to 40%. 
women are much more integrated into the employment market, which is just doubling. Yes, indeed, we doubled the percentage. In higher education, we're talking about 17% of Arab students who are actually 17% of the overall percentage. There is also very good high representation of women. Yes, 65% of Arab students are women. There is a revolution taking place within Arab society in this respect. We have really gone into high tech and public transportation. I don't know if you know, but until 2010, we didn't have public transportation in Arab villages. Now we have public transportation in almost all villages. Where did we fail? We have failed in the matter of planning and housing. Housing. We're talking about a problem with housing in the Jewish sector, but in the Arab sector, okay, well, in the Jewish sector, it's also a point. Yes, but at least we talk about it. In the Arab sector, there really is such distress when it comes to housing. There are some successes, but still, we need to have a lot more done. Okay, Nasri, I'd like to ask you, if we go back to the personal stories, is there anything that you see personally that this plan has really been successful in? Something I dealt with in the last two years is writing a master plan for the Ministry of Education for informal education. Because uh, the state used to allocate zero shekel for informal education for young Arabs. And uh, I was asked to write the program for 560 million. And today I see kids that after school, uh, they go to the community centers and they're in the activities, informal activities within the Arab uh, villages. And to me, this is a very, very important uh, area. But the person sitting on my right did not really deal with economic development. If you follow my writings, and there's a lot of discourse regarding the policy of the government, but I appreciate this person. He did deal with economic development, but what he did most was to form a trust between the Arab population and the government before talking about community centers and schools and whatever. This man dealt with building bridges over the real gap that there is between the Arab population in Israel and the government and the Jewish population. And there are such bridges, he we managed to build them. Sure, definitely so. The fact that Ayman, as a presence, he never gave up his nationality on the one hand. But on the other hand, he brought a very, very pragmatic discourse and managed to change paradigms uh, among Netanyahu and his ministers and also the Arab population. And after he left, we see in the polls a decline in the trust of the Palestinian Arab uh, uh, citizenship uh, against the uh, state. He did a lot, and I think that he deserves a real chapeau for that. Since you left, uh, nobody replaced you, right? How come you don't have a replacement? Because there's no other Ayman in existence. It's difficult to find. Professor Fisher, had I known that you're here in Israel, I would already, you know, I would pressure you to come up. So why don't you have a replacement, Ayman? This is not right. Yes, I actually retired uh, last May. Since then, there were scores of uh, candidates, but they couldn't find a real candidate. Uh, it takes time to appoint uh, senior people, because as you know, I uh, doubt what you're saying they couldn't find. I think it's a real damage. I think there's a very strong authority, 15 workers, Jews and Arabs, without a director for eight months now. And we managed to build something which is really strong, and it's a shame to really uh, spoil it. Somebody has to be appointed. Uh, I really want to focus. How do you transfer this from an economic success to increase the integration of the Arabs in the Israeli society? And what's going to happen soon when this five-year plan in 2020 is going to end? The five-year plan is supposed to change the allocation mechanisms. After the five years, the Ministry of Transportation is supposed to give us the budget, also in formal education and other fields as well. But I want to bring a few figures. 
that I think are jeopardizing uh, the successes. And that is the way in which the ministers and the prime ministers uh, make statements. A few things that were published recently, 53% of the Jewish population in Israel thinks that we want to destroy the country. This idea that on the one hand, they, they give us money, they invest in us, they want us to integrate in the Israeli economy, they want to reduce the poverty, they want us to integrate into the labor market, but on the other hand, the economy is actually being held in the uh, Jewish population. And this dualism that they give us money, but they incite against us, this is something that really jeopardizes uh, the objective of this program. Another figure which I think is really problematic, it only shows how the democracy in Israel is void because 60% of the general Jewish population, secular, religious, whatever, think or not interested that Arab parties will be part of the coalition. So there's a consensus among the Jewish population that we are not part and parcel from the political game. And that uh, compels us to rethink both our political leadership, but also the Jewish leadership, because at the end of the day, we want to keep the state of Israel as a democratic state. When 20% is alienated from the decision makings and uh, to uh, do things as others do in the state of Israel, then I think that we have to develop it in order to change it. But I will challenge you, and I want to ask you, because really, uh, these uh, figures are not really nice. But had we held uh, the same polls among the Arab population about their attitude to the Jewish population, one thing, yeah, we asked this question. We asked to what extent uh, does the Arab population want to be partner in the government? We didn't say a right-wing government or a left. Listen, 81% of the Arab population wants the Arab parties to be partners in the coalition, namely the Arab population want to be part and parcel of the state of Israel. They want to uh, be decision makers. They want, uh, not in the levels, but, but, but when we talk about the attitude, the attitude towards the Jewish society, not just the integration, well, the figures are very optimistic. More than two-thirds of the Arab population see themselves as part of the Israeli society, part of the economy. People want to integrate. Uh, by the way, in the Jewish population also, 65% uh, uh, see the Arabs as ones who want to integrate. So there are uh, contradictions in the way the Jews see the Arabs and vice versa. But I think it's very much connected to the way the ministers and the prime ministers, the, the, the hate, the racism um, infiltrate into uh, the discourse. And I would expect responsibility. Nobody is going to evaporate. Nobody is going to disappear from here. So I think just as the president said, we are doomed to live together. So let's make it much better. And at the end of the day, nobody is going to go away. Nobody is going to disappear. Let's make it a joint uh, adventure. Professor Watted, uh, I would like to expand about this dualism. Uh, you'll talk about the legal aspects maybe of the uh, nation law, but we were talking about a plan here, which is revolutionary, uh, spearheading, money that wasn't given in former years, and this plan was uh, um, accepted by a right-wing government. It's uh, the same government that actually enacted the, the nation law. So what's the question? I want to talk about this dualism that on the one hand, I'm sure that you will say very harsh words about the nation law, but on the other hand, it's the same uh, law, uh, government uh, that did the five-year plan. And I want to ask you about the legal aspects and the legal significances of the nation law. First of all, I'm not a politician, and I don't have any political uh, ambitions. So I'm not really interested if it's a right-wing, left-wing government, but I'm interested in the fact that uh, the construction of a state vis-a-vis -vis its uh, citizens or the minority will work in the proper way. There are a lot of uh, studies and psychological studies. How can it be that Begin is the one who made the peace agreement and uh, other examples as well? 
so that it all depends on the dynamics of what's going on. And I don't want to praise uh, somebody, but if you know the story of this special budget, I think that the figures in this uh, ministry had some significance. Ayman, his contribution, his presence had a cardinal significance, and I'm not uh, exaggerating. On the other hand, you have to see, you need two for tango, uh, but they don't continue. You don't need just two loving persons for tango. You need two people who know how to dance and want to dance together. There is a gap today, and I'm not an expert of statistics, but I can analyze the polls that I see. There's a real gap between the ideology, the political ideology of the representatives who sit in Jerusalem and the real situation uh, in the field. My colleague said before that 80% uh, of the Arab population support uh, Arab parties to be part of the government, and it's correct. But the question is how many out of these parties in the Knesset wish or want or agree to be part of the government? And the answer is no one. Uh, they may support, as like they did uh, with Rabin in Oslo or during the disengagement at the time, but uh, that's uh, proof regarding the Jewish population. When you present to the Jewish population, this uh, political demagogy, which is uh, hollow regarding the Arab Jews' relationship, you get one answer. But when you start asking the Jewish population about their attitude to the Arab population, everybody says that everybody wants to live together and everybody has a, a story about the, the Jewish uh, neighbor and the Arab neighbor and the Sephardi neighbor and the Ashkenazi. At the end of the day, everybody understands that we live in a multicultural society and we come from, you know, people came from Arab countries or from Europe or people who lived uh, before the state in Palestine or today in mixed uh, cities. That's not the issue. Shall I continue with the nation law or what? I know that what I'm going to say now is not very popular, especially not uh, among the Arab uh, citizens, but that's my opinion, and I uh, expressed it in 2008. I am not so excited by this nation law, but, but if uh, the poet Jubran would be with us today, he would say that this nation law is only half the truth, half the dream. The state of Israel was established as a Jewish democratic state. I don't have a problem with this definition, but I support it wholeheartedly because uh, the one who supports uh, the right of the Palestinian people to have a state, an Arab and democratic state, a nation state, has to support the idea that there should be a state here which is Jewish and democratic. By the way, if we uh, take uh, the credit from another politician, I heard that Ahmed Tibi is uh, uh, for a state of all its nations. Namely, you can have a state uh, where you have a democratic citizenship if you, even if you belong to another nation. So what's the problem with this law? It's an interesting anecdote. The ones who criticized the Supreme Court uh, and said that, that uh, the uh, basic laws are constitutional, all of a sudden they uh, talk about uh, uh, something which is completely not new. The state of Israel is a Jewish state, yes. The Hebrew language is official, yes. It's part of the basic law in the legislation uh, from uh, the beginning of the state. It's like a constitution. The Arab uh, language has a special status. It's not official. First of all, it's not exactly what it says. It says that it has a special status. Then it says uh, that the status of the Arab uh, language uh, is the same as it was in the past. So it has both a, an official. So if I would sit you here in the panel with Ayala Chaked, the Minister of Justice, no, 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 don't run. I said in the beginning that I'm not a politician, so I'm not... Uh, uh, I don't want to talk about politicians. But the problem is with uh, the nation law is, uh, first of all, in the interpersonal 
uh, aspect and the legal aspect. It's like um, poking a uh, finger into the eyes of the Arab population. Uh, the Druze, uh, for example, they serve in the army, they're blood brothers, uh, but they're not uh, brothers in life. So uh, this is uh, what Lieberman says. Uh, all of a sudden, they say, even if you serve in the army, you're still uh, not a complete Israeli. <coughs> but uh, the legal aspect is uh, stronger than that. All of a sudden, people are very uh, anxious. Uh, all of a sudden, they have resources where in 2019, and there is not one law, not one law in the state of Israel that gives the citizens the constitutional right for freedom of expression, which they do in any Western country. Of course, we have freedom of expression, but who has it? only the uh, Supreme Court, the same uh, court that people want to influence the appointments and which is criticized all the sudden. So the problem is not the nation law itself, but it's only half the way. It ignores an entire population that exists in this uh, state of Israel according to the call of independence. And uh, woe to my country, the state of Israel, the day that it's ashamed of its own democracy, the day where it blurs the Israeli's uh, identity. If I say Israeli, it doesn't say anything. If I say Jewish, it definitely has a meaning. If I say Arab, it also has a different meaning. But we have to be proud of democracy, not just for talking about it, but in practice. I don't agree that the Israeli democracy is empty, but it's limited. Pink. Professor Wattet tried to escape politics, but Khadr, I would like to talk politics with you as a political science professional because we are in the eve of elections, 79 days to elections. Let's talk about the joint party history and future. First of all, to what extent was this party part and parcel of this uh, program? Uh, I can, can I vouch the members of the par Israeli parliament were part of the discussions for building the plan, setting the borders of budgeting, and distributing uh, funds, at least in this uh, respect. So as far as this is concerned, is it only me who didn't see them talk that much about it? Well, the problem is that it was not, there was no PR for that. And uh, apolitical is also uh, a personal. My children for several years time go to summer camps that are subsidized by this budget of nine to two and nobody talks about it in a huge um, area like Shfaram, one of the largest uh, area, Arab areas. No place would you hear that this is budgeted from nine to two. The entire uh, programs for all community centers, uh, the non-formal education, every reform in public transportation, it is not being PR'd. And even more surprising, the Arab Knesset members don't talk about it, perhaps fearing they would be deemed uh, having an alliance, some sort of an alliance with the government. And I say that there is such an alliance occurring, indeed. However, the government as well does not market, did not market the entire uh, things that were done as part of 922, so I am surprised myself. Let's talk a little bit towards the upcoming elections. I'm not sure if there's going to be a joint uh, Arab party. No, Ahmed Tibi says that he wants to be out of that. Uh, so what are going to be the influ influences? And do you really believe Ahmed Tibi? Or is he simply aiming at more seats? I'm not going to quote uh, what uh, we talked amongst ourselves uh, personally. Well, why not? We wish to hear about it, all about it. I don't want him to know that I'm leaking some uh, personal discussions. So it's not only Ahmed Tibi, Dr. Ahmed Tibi, Many of the Arab leaders 
that are not chadash. Somebody decided to take an action, and I think it's not only Ta'al, the Arab movement held by Ahmed Tibi will do this, but also other enterprises. We could see it also from the political arm, not political arms as the speaker, but the political body that represents the Islamic movement the southern yes, faction, there is a chance that they also, they headed by Dr. Mansour Abbas, they are making all sorts of signs uh, that they're going to uh, try their own power as a separate uh, party until Today, this morning at least, there was an agreement for two uh, parties with a surplus agreement. Who is going to join whom? The combinations are not yet clear, but I guess every two will be together. The political implications, perhaps the Arab representation would lose one mandate. As for practical implications regarding promoting of uh, political equality and financial development, I guess this is not going to be that significant because the expectation is that the ones to win this mandate is rather the central uh, parties or left wings and not the right-handed. According to my own estimation, it's going to go towards merits. Uh, political party, and uh, quite a, a lot uh, Arab citizens would like to vote for Meretz because they have on the list uh, Sarif Frej in a secured place in the Knesset, and also because of the political uh, activity that they have been doing in the last uh, parliament session. Before I go to personal closing questions, I'd like to uh, go back to Professor Watted. We talked about national state law. You said that uh, you're not so excited about you, but uh, I should hold before I put you together with Ayelet Shaked in the same panel. But I want to ask you about the Nagba about uh, loyalty and culture and others. When you see all of these accumulated, are you still not moved and shaken? Well, this is a different story. In the last decade, the reins have been in the hands of politicians whose perception and understanding of democracy not only is it distorted and not the right one, but they take us back to dark ages in world history. Until Second World War, the term democracy was perceived there's a majority, the majority won, the majority can do whatever they wish. Any law legislated by a majority is a right one and a just one simply because the majority decided upon it. Governments in this way promoted all sorts of initiatives and activities that we shouldn't mention here, particularly not in this day and event. The first lesson that occurred in the in Europe in its entirety after Second World War is that democracy is not the rule of majority, but rather how do you limit the power of the majority? Because of that, there were constitutional um, courts of law all through Europe. There was re-education for justices. You as a judge must make sure that minorities, not, nation, not only national minorities, they can be gender minorities and others, you need to defend them because they don't have the power to defend themselves in the parliament. And now, on TV screens, we see senior people in the Israeli government. We were elected in order to rule, and so we can promote any law. And while doing that, they're trampling over human rights. When you look at this entire legislation initiative, and I'm not talking only politics, 
The join, join the, the common denominator of all of these laws is this distorted perception, which is because the majority thinks a certain way they can do a certain thing, this is dangerous. It's dangerous for those who run for the long haul. And when the state of Israel will have to face itself in 30 years' time, perhaps before that, and she'll say in front of the mirror, who is the fairest of them all? She won't be able to glorify itself because it is this palace in the Mediterranean jungle. It could maybe compare itself to Egypt and, or Turkey, and I don't want to see this coming. I want to, us to compare ourselves to enlightened European countries. And now, on a personal note, two minutes per speaker, and I'm going to be very, very strict now. What does the country, what does Israel need to do so that the Arab minority feels more of a part of the social, economic, and political structure in Israel? I want to start with you, and I want you also to um, maybe relate to what the friends have said. Maybe you didn't externalize the achievements of the five-year plan. So two things. First of all, regarding the uh, PR, we didn't do that uh, great of a job. Uh, whether there was an intention behind it or not, I'm not answering this right now, but this is the fact. We didn't really put any effort into it. At the same time, I can say two things. First of all, the representatives of the joint party, not all of it, but also Ayman Ode was also part of the discussions regarding 92. When Ayman Ode was asked, what uh, is your greatest achievement? He did say 92. So as far as I'm concerned, I did my part. If there is a fight over credits, who is the leader? I think that this is very, very strong. But I also have some criticism over the uh, Hebrew media. Uh, there's a very, you have a very popular show. Uh, these things that we do are not interesting enough or sexy enough. Uh, call us, invite us to your studios, to your shows. Uh, you say that uh, the TV prefers bad stuff. So we worked very hard in the past 10 years to put the issue of the integration of Arab population in Israeli economy. And I think that we managed to do it. And it is one of the leading priorities of the government. And we can see it by the budgets. There are earmarked budgets that are flowing towards Arab society are uh, invested there at the same time. Not everything is about money. We also need, as Nasrin said, we need politicians to talk for this uh, integration. You cannot give a one million shekel on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, institute laws that are going to uh, have the Arab population out of the entire society. It harms our efforts to try and incorporate Arab population uh, within the Israeli economy. And so, uh, budgets are very important, but we also need public support. And the last thing that I would say here, we must change the dialogue. We, are, we the Arab society, are not poor. You're not doing us any favors. We are an asset to the state of Israel. And this is how you should uh, consider us, relate to us, to our young people. I talked to... Uh, this morning, 30% of students in the Israeli Technion are Arabs. We have a huge human resource, human capital. We want to be integrated in this uh, state, and we want the, popu the population wants it, and we need to allow them to do it. Look at it as an asset, not as a burden. It has great potential for contribution for promoting the state of Israel. Okay, you're out of time, Nasrin. So I'll try to be very succinct, changing this course, changing this course, and changing this course. I really believe and I prefer 10 billion shekels less, but I want honor. We want to feel that we're being respected, that we're being welcome in our own home, in our own uh, homeland. Uh, the government's decision regarding representation in the public sector, uh, they already managed to achieve it in 2012. And since then, that's it. We were talking about 10%, and there was no new 
government uh, resolution regarding proper representation. I think it's time that the state decides on a new target, but people, uh, people like Ayman should be at the crossroads of decision making. People should be able to provide answers for our real needs. The third point, and this is the one that Ayman started uh, talking about, is the issue of uh, planning and construction. There are 50,000 families currently who are um, whose home is going might be demolished this is not nice uh, when you need uh, to uh, face day by day the idea that you might uh, come back to your home or it might be a pile of stones and i think it's going to be a great gesture on the part of the state of israel to regulate the issue of planning and construction and to remove this threat from the tens of thousands of families and the last point and this is on a personal note i have a family in Gaza. I have a family who lives in Jabalia, the refugee camp. I have a family in Hebron. I'm part of the Palestinian people and I'm an Israeli citizen. So these two identities do not clash. I think that the two identities complement each other. And I think that the dispute, and you cannot disregard this elephant in the room, the mere fact that my state is in a dispute with my families, with my people, is something we have to put a stop to. We cannot disregard it and we cannot continue managing this uh, dispute. It's ultimately, it's going to bring ruin to the state of Israel. And so I think that in order for us to be able to talk about uh, immigration and uh, social mobility and the fact that people can sit here and not say, I talked to someone from an Arab state, but they will say it uh, proudly. And we can be the bridge between the state of Israel and the Arab world and the Muslim world in the Middle East. And so we can be utilized. We can be this bridge. And I offer my country to do the right thing and to end this uh, dispute, to stop managing it. And then life would seem a lot better. This is cha the challenge of challenges, Khadr. Promoting a dialogue in after 9 to 2, we need just like uh, they did with the Bedouins in the Negev, the first five plan, and then the second five year plan. After 9 to 2, we need 9 to 3. There are quite a few issues of local municipalities in the Arab sector. The uh, Ministry of Interior should demand from the municipalities their plans for allocating budgets or budget planning so that uh, we see that money is being utilized and utilized properly. I would like my country to look at me not as a hard-working person, but rather as the architect. Thank you all. We apologize for the electricity break. Thank you all.